Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Bogdan Atanasov. I teach prehistoric archaeology at the New Bulgarian University in Sofia. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our new season, uh, new season in our uh, BEMA Balkan and Eastern Mediterranean Archaeology uh, seminar. And as you can see on the screen, we have a very strong start for you. It's Stefan Palitov. And I pass the word to Angela uh, Pencheva, uh, who will introduce Stefan. So I'd like to welcome everyone who joined the seminar tonight. This is actually our first BEMA seminar for the winter semester of 2020. Um, my name is uh, Angela Pencheva. I'm the representative of the Volcan Heritage Foundation tonight who is going to moderate the lecture of our colleague and friend Stefan Pavitov. And I'm very happy to announce this presentation because uh, it's something which we didn't have before. So the title of the presentation is Applying Immersive Technologies for New Cultural Experiences at uh, Heritage Destinations. Uh, I would like uh, to say a couple of words about this, that uh, practically um, Stefan is going to speak about something uh, which uh, is a kind of a um, new experience for the Balkan heritage as well, because we were partnering in a big European project in the past two years, uh, dealing with immersive technologies. So some of you, as you can see in the list of the um, participants tonight, uh, know what I'm talking about because you were part of our field schools in Stovi, um, and Mona, and Viminatium, and I'm very happy to see you tonight. So um, I'm going to say a couple of words about Stefan. Uh, actually, this is a, his short bio. He works as extended reality film and cultural practitioner and researcher. Some recent notable contributions include artistic residency uh, at ZKM, Center for Art and Media, Karlsruhe, and UNESCO Media Art Residency in Changsha, China. Currently leads the experimental cluster uh, at Extended Reality Bavaria and works at Extended Reality Experience Design Consultant. The focus of his research and practice includes interactive and non-interactive storytelling, play systems, extended reality experience design, virtual and hybrid cultural spaces, new media in education, HMI and art uh, and um, technique. His academic background includes uh, a BA in philosophy um, at a FAO, a FAO MU International Academy program and uh, masters in uh, media arts, culture, cultures, Erasmus Mundus Excellence program. Um, so I would like to pass the word to Stefan now um, and wish you pleasant time in uh, the next hour. Thank you, Angela, for such a, such a lovely introduction. Uh, it sounds better when I hear it from someone else. <laughs> um, okay, I'm very, very happy to be here um, and to have this conversation with you because it's such an interesting topic that is getting more and more traction in... Um, in this, this region in general, uh, worldwide, we already see a lot of uh, experiments in this field since the last 30 years, uh, even before in the late 80s. But the technology has uh, moved forward so much that uh, now we get we have much more accessible tools that are available to us, um, in different institutions, academic inst uh, organizations as well. and. Um, some of the project uh, some of the projects that are very interesting on international scale and this is something that i would like to highlight as well the the need for collaboration in interdisciplinary international settings um such as the project that angela mentioned um so this was this was something that really brought together a lot of interesting people and uh we were able to look into i into wanted to watch it on this so oh. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, so it was quite a so it was quite an experience, and um, I can share some of those uh, those experiences with you. Uh, to take it to take it forward. Yeah, first I'm I'm happy to see some faces um, here. I will yeah 
I'll, I will just uh, go over the, the topics for, for, for today. First, if we want to discuss what is what are these technologies, we need to understand what they try to achieve and to understand the context um, of why we have them as we have them today. So we will try to figure out how immersion works. We will try to figure out how uh, immersive technologies work. And um, in the second part, we will go more into the examples of immersive works in culture. And of course, in the end, I would love to, to hear your thoughts on it. Um, you can, you know, like every, every technology has its own, um, you know, pits, pitfalls and problematic issues. And definitely we need to be very aware when we think about what we are applying and why. So um, we avoid uh, issues that may arise from, from all of this. So you know, already mentioned, but just a brief overview, overview of, of some of the research that I've, I've done. And sometimes I, I, I like to use this trajectory of my, of my research as, um, as, as just an example of openness of an inter interdisciplinarity. Um, the idea is that we live in a time now where projects always happen in interdisciplinary teams and you really need to figure out the language and uh, methodology of its iterative design practices, collaborative uh, design, just a way to understand and communicate in order to move forward with, uh, with the project that we're trying to develop. Um, I will just focus on the last three here. Uh, very lovely consortium, this Media Art Cultures program. Um, for example, like every university had its own strong side that was installed into, into the program. So for example, Danube University in, in Krems uh, was working with uh, cultural preservation, especially digital um, works, digital artworks, but also cultural heritage, mediation, remediation, how to use new, new technologies. Um, Alberg University in Denmark focusing more on uh, design practices, cultural industry, uh, very hands-on things, new technologies. And of course, um, School of Creative Media has a lovely lab I will mention it briefly later in some of the examples that we will go over in Hong Kong, where you, know, you, can, you can really test out certain things, especially in the context of playable media, interactive media, um, and play systems. So it is a very interesting combination, and um, you can you can take out so many elements of it and, and put it put it together. Um, you know, I mentioned briefly some of some of the works that I've been doing, um, some research that I've done in in Centrum für Kunst und Medien in ZKM um, in Karlsruhe, that was the leading center for development of immersive spaces and virtual reality since the early 80s. Uh, sorry, 90s, um, military grade technology, a lot of funding and playing just with those spaces in the cultural sphere. Um, also some work with, uh, with UNESCO, we'll talk briefly about that. My main point of this uh, research and I mean this lecture is to, is just to share some experiences and some very interesting examples that we can uh, where we can see how technology is applied in a more um, non-immediate way, let's put it that way. Because uh, like as every new technology, we, we always struggle to figure out how we can use it, um, what are the benefits of it. So now we are more in this conservative approach of how we use virtual reality, more of a view, viewing device instead of a uh, tool that extends ourselves uh, and our bodies into the virtual into the virtual space. So we will go um, a bit there. I always put this here because it opens up sometimes discussion afterwards. This was my uh, thesis, focusing mostly on how we design uh, virtual reality uh, narratives and experiences but focusing on embodiment and the ludonarrative dissonance that may come out of it, the conflict between the need of the body to behave in a certain way into the story and how we give and take um, elements there. So first is figuring out immersion, like because um, I, I don't wanna really go deep dive into, into this. It is more about figuring out 
what is the trajectory of our, our historical attempt to represent ideas and share meaning through uh, the stories that we tell. And we have been exploring very different types of technologies and um, immersion can come from some very, very basic uh, things. Think about caves, playing with fire and shadows in caves, uh, cave paintings um, that must have been um, as immersive as VR, I would say. Um, however, now we are moving forward to what is called uh, the virtualization of the artifact, meaning that the artifact uh, now is in, in its digital form uh, can be interacted with, can be changed, and then it can revert automatically to its original state of zero state. So other people can uh, have experience from the same point. That is one element, the virtualization of digital artifacts. And the other one is the dispersion of content and media around us uh, in the 360 environment. So this, um, as we move forward, is going to be pretty much just figuring out how we arrive today to the first person perspective device. Um, first person perspective, you know, in, in, in history of art, of course, we know that the, the gaze of the audience and uh, the intention that any creator has uh, with what, whatever type of artifact they're, they're creating um, takes the audience into account. So there is a right way of looking at things that are made. So uh, we're always in this subject-object relationship, right? Um, we used to do that when we were in the, in the theaters. The focal point was, of course, in the center, but you could more or less have a full circle and just walk around and experience it from, from other uh, angles. However, um, as time went by, we started doing things for specific points of view in, in, in an immediate intent. So um, I love this cathedral because it employs so many different technologies that create very unique uh, per, uh, first person perspective or FPP, uh, let's call it like that from, from here on. So you can imagine that you have here paintings, you have uh, architecture, you have sculpture that creates a very um, immense experience right here. And um, there is also another, I mean, the, the, the first important moment is that, um, as we know, throughout Europe, when you go inside cathedrals, usually between the um, aisles, you will see a stone that is slightly discolored or a different color. Um, and that is the, the FPP stone, uh, as, as we jokingly call it. It is that from that point, if you stand there, you will have the full experience of the cathedral as it was uh, envisioned by the, by the creators of it. Here, of course, acoustics play, uh, plays incredible role, very important, neglected quite often uh, today because we are dominated so much by visual uh, media. However, um, we already have um, a lot of experience even from that time uh, regarding regarding um, audio reverberations and how to design spaces in order to create uh, distances to create uh, immersion. Um, so here we already start to get more complicated ideas of immersion. The idea that you are present in an environment in a constructed environment um, that has shut you out from the um, from from the external uh, sensorial input as much as possible, or I would I often um, use the the definition of Jan Huizinga regarding uh, how the magic circle of play comes into place. Um, so all these immersive spaces um, are pretty much uh, the same. They create this magical environment where we voluntarily uh, most of the time go inside, um, and they reconstruct the relationship between things inside that magical uh, circle space. So we get to experience things um, in, a, in, a, in, a more immersive, in a more immersive way. So we have, we have been playing with this idea 
uh, with distributing content in a 360 environment. And um, I like this example because it's, first it's you know fairly old, um, but it takes into account something very very interesting. For example, you can see you can see the two platforms, the lower one and the upper uh, platform, and uh, the rotundra was painted, of course, uh, back then. But it took into account the uh, distortion, the visual distortion that you would have f uh, when you're looking at this image uh, from the lower deck and from the upper deck. And it was painted in such a way that you could view it from both uh, decks um, and still have a right perspective uh, of the image. So if you see it frontally, the image would look a bit off. Um, but if you see it from these uh, two platforms, it would it would work just fine. So this is an example that we are really moving forward into creating um, this distributed content with the, you know, this, this 360 distributed content with the idea of a specific FPP. And then we get more and more into uh, immersion, into senses, uh, not necessarily having content that is distributed all around us, but really doubling down on this uh, idea of shutting down external stimuli and phenomena and just creating these magical spaces where the reality is uh, constructed. But because of the lack of external validation of uh, what is going on or not going on um, in this uh, window to another reality, we see um, the rise of cinema, especially 20th century, the media, the media of the 20th century, and when you think about what VR, what cinema is, basically it is a collective VR experience, um, very immersive. You have um, an audio all around you today, of course, systems like, for example, um, you know, the dome structures, like the audio domes, where you would have more than 100 um, speakers placed on, on, in tactical locations to create fully immersive experience. And of course, uh, the window to another another reality. However, uh, we can see the need to have more control over the medium, and where the true birth of, of a new medium is already in the fifties and the sixties. Exploring these technologies, there are many different type of these, let's call them, virtual reality devices. Um, some of them lived for a decade or two, some did not make it at all. Uh, the, the history is very rich, especially after World War II, a lot of technology um, getting was, was available, a lot of research was done, so min miniaturization of technology started uh, occurring, so um, different, different innovators played with these technologies. On the left you have um, the, the famous Sensorama, where you could um, just sit there look frontally at an, at an image, have audio, but also you would have fan that would blow wind uh, in your face. So you can use two uh, knobs to navigate and move around the space. So uh, the, the reality would always be um, as you intend, like you would look at, um, at the, in the direction that you, that you would prefer. On, on the right is the very famous uh, sort of Democles research that, is, that was done in the late 60s, it's a university research, and it's the first augmented reality headset. Of course, it was huge, it was heavy. Um, you can find it online. There are videos of this. Um, basically, it was a see-through device that projected a wire frame of a cube in space. Um, very rudimentary, but still successful research. So all of these ideas of distributing content around us and um, being shut out of the, the stimuli, having the ability to interact with the object that can change, uh, respond to us, but always revert to its initial zero state where other people can interact with it, uh, pretty much just took us to, to what we have today, uh, fairly simple, cheap headsets um, that we can use um, for example, here you can see my enthusiasm, still with long hair. Uh, with my friends, we were ready to 
fly four giant robots in space and just fight <laughs> and defend our, our our ship so you can see that we already got to the point of industry uh, especially entertainment industry has a lot of these location-based cultural institutions um, definitely research institutions um, acad acad academia but also uh, applied in various other industries uh, all across the board so adoption is uh, is pretty much happening there instead of the mass market that is of course going slow because we don't have a universal use of it now still so these two elements um, why we had this short trajectory it's because when we look at technology today we need to understand what it tried to solve from what was before and um, this image here shows people reading newspaper uh, it shows other things as well but let's focus on the newspaper and uh, when you think about it newspaper is a very it's a basically a painting with with some with some uh, words uh, in it but when you think about it it's a rectangular shape that is non-interactive and you can zoom uh, the information out of that uh, object that you observe now we pretty much are following the same trajectory uh, 100 years later uh, now we have just added interactivity and of course the world wide web so the contrast between the two images, I, I really liked it, like it because it shows the intentionality that we had from our media, um, how it evolved into the solution of uh, the technology that we employ. So we have arrived to, to a point historically in um, a moment where we're renegotiating the screen. We're renegotiating what the screen is. Uh, Lev Manovic is talking a lot about these things, especially the... Um, the nature of the screen that the screen is not uh, what you would what, what you call a neutral uh, medium of presentation uh, in, uh, of presenting information arguably not pretty much no medium is uh, neutral but the creation uh, he would call it the hegemony of the screen was destroyed with its dissolvement into a 360 environment in, in the 360 environments so now we don't have the hegemony of the film director anymore or the uh, camera person controlling our view into the new into the other reality but we have a freedom to navigate um, uh, as we as we wish of course this is not really completely true uh, there are many other ways of how you can employ technologies to move people um, in virtual spaces without them even knowing what they're doing. Uh, there are the famous ideas of nudge technology, uh, nudge principles or persuasive technologies that are employed in this type of um, interactive storytelling. And this is where the real, the real power of the technology is felt. Um, so two main principles from, from this entire uh, segment how to figure out what is the most important thing for immersion. On one hand, it's the 360 environment. So this is a cardinal change from what we've had before regarding um, our, how, how used we are to interact with the screen. So the 360 environment is something that, um, that is critical. And of course, the uh, uh, added agency of the users, of the audience, uh, or the principle of virtuality. Uh, what I what I talked about that the digital artifact now is interactable, and it can um, it can be manipulated. Then it can revert back to the original state, so it can be reused in the same manner. Um, so these are the two main elements. So when we talk about immersive technologies, just to just to have a short overview, so we know what we are what we are how to frame things, at least to put them in some form or in, in order to categorize them as much as possible, uh, which is an issue. Uh, the issue is because when when the term virtual reality came around, that was in the uh, 80s, Jerome Lanier 
one of the famous uh, early researchers in, um, in immersive uh, media. He pretty much just used virtual reality as an umbrella term for a lot of research in human computer interaction and immersive technology and neurocognitive studies. So everything just got stuck inside. Even today, we don't have very strict categories, although we understand AR and VR in its, in its fundamental difference, uh, which can help us to um, not just to understand technology, but also to communicate our ideas better when once we get into production. One of the main differences, let's start with augmented reality here, is that with augmented reality, um, we have a viewing device, a see-through viewing device, uh, slightly different, of course, you can see the phone and you can uh, see the, the glasses. Um, the phone, the see-throughness of the phone is uh, because of its camera. The, the glasses, you know, it, it works, it, they work as a, as a standard glasses. Um, so what you have here in this um, application of the technology is that augmented reality, as the, the name itself uh, suggests, augments the you know, phenomena that are around us. For example, if we have, uh, let's say, this tree and this bird as phenomenon that we observe, uh, we can have the phenomenon of, of the bird being changed, let's say, from a dove to a seagull, which is a bit difficult to do still because moving objects are not that easily tracked. But that is a question of computation and computer vision, not of principle. Um, then we have things that are um, completely foreign into the space. For example, this uh, flying alien here. Um, Pokemon Go, of course, one of the most famous applications of uh, AR, that would be the case. Um, then you have the digital objects interacting with the physical environment. Um, you can have um, a lot of ways to get creative with this. We see this a lot in tourism. We see a lot of this in um, entertainment industry, in the service industry, where you would have you know, different elements just interacting with the environment, especially regarding presentation of some things. And of course, you can change the body. If you have ever used Instagram and if you have, you have put funny ears uh, or some cool glasses, you have used augmented reality, you have changed uh, your body. So the digital objects, they are interact with the physicality of, of the body that is present. On the other hand, uh, virtual reality is a bit more aggressive in its control of the senses. So it shuts us out of the, of the environment more or less completely, which gives it this freedom to create completely new um, state of phenomena. One is, of course, that the body that you embody now in virtual space, unlike augmented reality, is no longer yours. Of course, the body can, uh, in AR, can be changed to not resemble as your body, but this is mostly done in virtual reality. Um, and you can create any sorts of phenomenon. You can duplicate in things that are in the physical world. You can connect them somehow differently, or you can create completely other places. And one of the more interesting examples is this um, application of one-to-one -one ratio tracking of physical objects. So for example, um, very often you would have this in artistic uh, experiments where you would have a wooden box like this one. Um, and then you can track a chair on top of it in virtual space. Um, so when someone goes and tries to sit on the chair, they actually sit on the box, but they, they see a chair uh, where they sit. So there are a lot of experiments like this. I don't really go into this lecture in those. They're more on the artistic side. But um, this, there's a lot of things that can be, can be done here in this regard. So in general, that is the spectrum of extended reality where augmented reality and virtual reality are sort of um, opposite each other and this weird blend between, um, between themselves. In everything falls somewhere in the middle, um, 
we're of course still figuring out categorization and the nomenclature that is changing of course all the time and it will continue to do so so we will see how it will all, all end up quick overview of the technologies that we currently have and how they work in principle um, when we talk about augmented reality mostly we see marker-based um, experiences so as you can see here, we have a viewing device, in this case, a phone, but it can be glasses. It can be, um, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, you see the second image, which is a standard um, AR marker. Any type of image can be an AR marker. Um, it is used to fix the coordinate system XYZ axis into space. Um, so the device understands uh, what is, that understands the 3D space that is observing. We have done some interesting stuff um, for Immersive Bavaria, a, 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 an organization in, in Munich that brings together governmental institutions, research institutions, artistic organizations, um, film funds, and whatnot. This Immersive Bavaria has a very interesting polygonal um, deer as, a, as an emblem. So uh, we created an AR, um, an, an AR use of the flyer where the logo is. Um, not me personally, but uh, people from the from the team that were doing the, those things, and it was quite successful, I must say, because it was used to um, to create a mini game that people could and can engage with. So it was quite a it was quite a success. Um, so. Anything can can uh, can be used. The best thing would be to have high contrast images. Uh, you can see why on the third one, um, and on the fourth one, you can see how it puts the three D coordinates on the on the marker, and then it uses those to place an object into a, into the three D space. Then on the last image, you can see the um, digital object, how it looks uh, in placed into the physical space. And if you move around it, and it behaves as if it's a real object and can be observed um, in from from every every side. Another one, which is more tied to computer vision, but this is also integrated into a lot of headsets today. You know that a lot of um, you know that a lot of devices use uh, hand tracking already. So it is something that you can see. Uh, around quite quite often so the way it works is that you would have um, an ai that understands how the joints work on the human hand and then it uses these landmark points to figure out where the joints are in the hand and then you can assign controls to different joints and joints and different behavior in this case we would have the index finger to write we would have two fingers to move around and all fingers to to uh, wipe everything off to erase it and you can just draw things in in air this can be done with a simple webcam um, so it's more about the principle and how it works if you can think if you think about it it's this very smart use of skeuomorphism in uh, interface design because it uses the innate uh, behavior that we have um, with our hands when we interact with the environment so for example we can think about how we if we if we see snow on a car and we use one finger to draw a smiley and then we use our entire hand to wipe it off so it recreates some of these behaviors that are are, are very familiar to us um, we can also use it for uh, playing with faces uh, this this thing is the is something that I built for um, in, in Denmark and then it's toured. It was an Ars Electronica. Uh, it is using facial tracking technology to basically point landmark points on your face and then attach certain um, triggers to them. And what it does is that the person sits down in front of a mirror, puts a head, puts headphones on and um, it, the person uses facial gestures to create music and poetry. Um, so you can play also with these technologies in augmented and virtual reality using, using face. 
Uh, finally, um, here you can see an image of how the headset is looking at the environment uh, and looking at the environment around us. So here you see, uh, you can see the, the arrows. So that is the three arrows, the X, Y, Z, uh, Z. So that's how the, the headset figures, figures out where it is. And it observes the distance from the objects that are in the room. It sends the signal back and it creates this uh, topographical sort of image of, of what is around, uh, around you. Uh, which is quite useful so you don't bump into things. Um, so the technology, we are, we are still uh, years before mass adoption. Um, we, we do have functional stuff. We do use, you can, we can use them every day. So for example, this is uh, in like in screen, in glasses, uh, screenshot from what we can use it for and what we use it uh, today integrated gps stuff to navigate into the environment and to overlay contextual information um, over the physical environment that we that we see around us so probably what we're going to see more and more in the upcoming years where um, a wider adoption of these technologies is going to occur is this contextual contextual information about what we are looking at um, and putting it into into different perspective so finally conclusions from from this part um no slater is a very interesting uh, person i was very fortunate to interview him uh, for extended reality bavaria uh, he's one of the leading researchers in um, virtual reality especially its psychological effects um, and design principles around those. He's been doing this since the 90s. Uh, one of the more interesting things he's been doing, he's doing uh, lately is creating scenario-based VR training for um, empathy training for uh, New York police. So he showed us some of those uh, work. So it's quite interesting to see where technology is moving. Um, very important just to put it all together, that the goal of immersion is to create the sense of the sense of presence, the sense that we are somewhere. And there are principles that uh, we need to keep in mind. Uh, you can see them on the screen. The idea is that the sensorial stimuli uh, obscure the existence of the device. So you don't think about the headset and the, you know, and the, the things that you have in your, uh, your hand about the wires or uh, anything that may be employed. Um, the entire environment, the virtual, the created, has to be consistent in the information it gives out. Uh, very important to have the possibility of interaction uh, with the environment. There is something that is called the Swayze effect. Um, it was coined very early into um, when, when VR was getting a bit more widely adopted around 2015, 14. Um, and it's based on the movie Ghost with Patrick Swayze. The idea is that you don't want to have the Swayze effect where uh, your audience feels like a ghost in an environment and no one reacts to their presence. Uh, it can cre create a very strong uh, dissonance of um, what is expected, how the world to interact, unless you want to create this experience, uh, that type of uh, feeling, right? Um, so, there is also this important importance of the movement of the body. There are two terms here. We will not go deeper into them. They're tied to neurocognitive sciences. They're called proprioception and kinesthesia. And it's basically about um, our aw the awareness of our body uh, because we have feeling of ourselves even without looking at our body. And there is a expected orientation that it's innate to us so we have sense of the body even without looking at it. Um, there is more research, a lot of research done on this subject. And um, we have to be careful not to distract the audience with, with inconsistency of how uh, of their expectation um, of how the virtual body behaves that they have adopted into the, into the virtual world. 
So takeaways. Extended reality, it is not related to a specific device. Usually when we talk about extended reality, we talk about, you know, a headset. That's how we, we envision it. But if we can create extended reality with so many other technologies. Holographic technology, of course, being one, projections, uh, 3D projections, all sorts of uh, tools and devices. Um, also important is that X, uh, extended reality XR is following this long-term aim of uh, recreating, documenting, just sharing uh, reality between, between people. Um, as we experience it through our senses. So to make it something uh, that is pre-verbal as an experience. Um, the general principles are 360 environments and agency interactivity with the, with the uh, content. Um, first person perspective is the key way of thinking when you're uh, creating this type of experiences. Um, and the goal is to establish and maintain sense of presence uh, in the virtual environment. Um, so establishing the, the, the first person perspective is done to sensorial inputs where the vision is dominant, but there are examples where other senses can take over if the design of the experience is done in such manner. And you can really do some very interesting things with this. Um, because mostly they are, as it says, multisensorial experiences. And agents and interaction in the virtual environment are play very important roles. So this is the general overview of what we are looking at when we are looking at um, immersive content, at augmented and virtual reality experiences. So for, the, for this part, I will uh, just look at few things this is just to mention a few things when we think about immersive content we need to think about a few things one is of course how the story behaves um, we are very familiar with linear storytelling and increasingly we are familiar with branching narratives where you can choose to go uh, to one point to, to get to one point from different roads sometimes circumventing entire points this, of course, opens up huge issues um, uh, regarding quality story of storytelling. Um, but keep in mind that we are interactivity presumes quite often the ability to navigate as one wills into the story to take paths on their own. Also, um, we have a lot of knowledge that we can draw now from uh, video games which are very close to uh, some experiences that we want to create, especially if we introduce gamification, um, but also the principles of play. How do we introduce interactive spaces where you need to teach people fairly fast um, what, the reality, what, what the rules of the reality um, that they are em embodying now are and how to play with it? The most important element is this one that I've put uh, down here. Um, Salen Zimmerman, by the way, Rules of Play, very important book regarding this. If anyone wants to research more regarding interactivity, um, you, you, you can definitely check this one out. So the very important thing is that the, the play contains quantifiable outcome or, or goal of the ending state. So you know you, what you want to achieve. This is very important in the um, in play, but also in immersion in general and immersive content because we don't want to have just a free roam um, unless that's a principle that that you employ. But mostly you will you will be encountering uh, these type of figuring out what the ending state is of the experience you're creating. Finally, it is very important to understand what type of experience you are uh, talking about. Um, the most dominant are, of course, seated and room scale currently, especially with the rise of the Quest. You can easily have a room, uh, a room scale experience. Most of the games that are created are room, room scale experience now. Um, and of course, you have things like free roam, which are very difficult to pull off, very expensive to pull off, 
this image here is four versus four players, ghost in the shell in Tokyo. I, I took this photo, very interesting um, outline in general. It is infrared cameras that are tracking eight people at the same time in the space, processing everything through, through a machine and having a shared experience inside. Of course, again, a bit complicated to do it uh, and to maintain it working. Um, but it's definitely something that um, that we have as one of the more interesting applications of these technologies. So again, now we are entering more into looking at the experiences. Always have these things in mind. How do we how do we uh, know what is the world? How do we know um, what is the role of the user? There is a very lovely uh, work by Rune Klevier, a researcher who is dealing with avatars. Uh, it is called Who Am I uh, in the Game World? So it is a lot of discussion about how we embody other characters. Um, and I take some of his research into context of how we embody other characters when those other characters are fully controlled one-to-one -one by our bodily movement. There is there's some interesting dissonance uh, that can come out of there or immersion that can be created. Um, then figuring out how, to intera how interaction works and then figuring out how uh, to present it, uh, basically. So I have links here. Let me see what would be the best way to do it. I think I can switch it like this. Mm. Let's see. I think I have turned off the, yeah. So um, what you have here is a technolo technology that is almost 10 years old. This video is almost 10 years old. And it is one of the standard, uh, standard elements of uh, put it full screen, standard way of applying um, technology, uh, augmented reality technology now. Um, so you have the Colosseum, let me put it a bit back. You have the Colosseum, you see it uh, having 3D elements and then you can turn on parts of the building, have it reconstructed, observe different historical aspects of it. And you can see that we, we have things like this now uh, pretty much all around us. So it's not about inventing uh, hot water or anything. It is about understanding what are best practices at, at this point. So we, we have those things. Then we have, if I go here, we have things like this which is a more advanced use. The, uh, and the technology, and it's, it's good to have the same, uh, a very similar uh, object of interest, in this case, the Colosseum, so we can see how we are using uh, uh, these technologies in a different... Hey, everybody, different. Here, and recently I was shopping at a local dollar store. What's I going on? 
Okay. Kane Ross, the Something is else. a <laughs> Okay, we don't need that. Um, let's see, it loads a bit slowly. Mm. Wait, let's go. Can you please give me a second? I will switch to uh, my in internet and we'll, yeah, just please give me a second. I think it's going to work better this way. Okay, so what you can see here is uh, the Colosseum, and you can see different uh, elements of it. Now, for example, we have a lot of these technology being used. Um, so this is a commercial trailer for it. So there are uh, also videos shot from like live videos, but I wanted to show you this uh, element. So here you see uh, different, one very common use, and that is the, where is it, come on. Yeah, and it's this. Basically you can use, uh, you can use these technologies now to have a very quick time, uh, time machine uh, representation and to see how things have developed and changed throughout history. Um, especially if you have major changes throughout some specific era, some, uh, some points of interest, historical points of interest, where you can see things uh, happening in front of you at much fa fa faster pace, of course, uh, being represented into the, into the environment there. Um, what we also have is something more traditional in that sense, and that is, for example, used in this cultural tourism. Um, one on the left is having this puzzle-like experiences where you have um, the, where you have the, um, how do you call this? Like the, entire, the entire wall, this is not even the entirety of the wall, um, represented into the gallery. And then you have, Use, using a, a tablet, this entire space, it is reconstructed into the environment where it was originally presented. So you can pretty much just join things together and recreate the entire, um, the entire wall as it used to be. And on the right side, you have more entertaining things where on a fort in Northern Ireland that is on the sea, you have a ship that comes by and you have to sink it. So you can play more with the environment. Um, here, um, sorry, I won't be opening these videos uh, because they're, they're quite simple concepts. For example, you have some old cannons that are standing there, but you, you do not interact with them. You interact with the idea of, of them. Now we're getting in some more complicated and more interesting stuff. This is one of my favorite experiences. It's called We Are Like Vapors, Pacifying these China Sea, developed by um, Jeffrey Shaw, who was a professor, a mentor of mine. Um, he was leading the Bildwissenschaft Institute in uh, Central von Kusten Median. Uh, they were doing a lot of work with, um, with projections, especially 3D projections in space. Um, and what why I like this, of course, the technology is very interesting. Um, it is what it opens up as a discussion of how you present and how you do you mediate heritage. Um, this entire system, it's called the Audiovisual Interactive Environment uh, or AVI for, for uh, short. And it consists of this version of six projectors. You can see them uh, on the top. And each projector is projecting 60 degrees uh, of the entire circle. Um, this screen 
there are several sizes of, of this installation. Uh, there is like eight, 10 and 12 meters uh, in diameter. Uh, and the screen is four meters uh, tall. So it's a very immersive space. Uh, they were tasked, this was developed by the way in um, University of New South Wales in Australia. And they use it for as a museum technology all around the world, but also in cultural uh, centers. Um, this one was commissioned by the Hong Kong Maritime Museum when they have uncovered um, they have uncovered a, sil a story silk scroll um, depicting some historical events, and they were figuring out how to tell the story of it. So first, they had the silk scroll that is. Uh, 55 um, centimeters and 18 meters uh, long. I will just jump forward to show it. It is always exhibited um, in the environment, if that is possible. But of course, you have it here, you can see it, but how do you experience it in a more uh, novel way? How do you make it a bit more interesting? Of course, the craftsmanship and its uh, historical uh, value, it's one thing. But now we're figuring out how to use technologies to remediate, remediate it, this, especially for new audiences that are, and especially younger audiences that are, have this uh, a bit, <laughs> how to call it, um, interesting relationship with cultural spaces and museum spaces. So going back to this one, uh, I can open it from here just to see it better. Um, what they did is they took the scroll, they scanned it with a very advanced technology, so you can have 40 uh, times optical zoom, and they have placed it into a 360 environment, in, into a 360 environment. Um, yeah, well, this loads, we'll wait a bit. Uh, I will show you a video now just to see how it looks. And, uh, and what they did with is that, of course, they have presented it into the space to share, to, to share the story, <laughs> share the story of, uh, let me turn this a bit. Um, like this. So, what you have here, as you can see it, it is that they have placed this scroll on screen. Um, and the scroll itself, it tells the story of the problem they had, the, the King Dynasty had with the pirates that at that time were ruling the, tr the trade routes in East Ch China Sea. Um, I think to date, still the biggest pirate uh, union that existed, thousands of ships. So the emperor is sending a general who is using diplomacy and cunning and military uh, knowledge to eventually defeat the to defeat the the pirates. So what they what they did here is um, of course first they animated some key elements of the story that was presented on the Silk Scroll. Um, to create more engaging narrative, but they also did something which, um, which I'll, I think it really brings the another dimension and to the entire historical context. What you see on the screen is the, the silk scroll being obscured by these vapors, by this fog, and what it happened is that they found. Uh, um, a book, a book of historical recollections and also some poetry, where one of the pirate leaders, after a fierce battle where the pirates won, uh, stood and overlooked the battlefield. And he had a moment of clarity where uh, the quote is, we are like vapors. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter how long we persist, the wind will, will eventually scatter us across the sea, meaning that the, that's Jeffrey, by the way, meaning that the king will, uh, the emperor will um, eventually 
and defeat them. So they took the idea of the vapors and they used it as this sort of fog of war. So you can look around, you can see it just as a video, but you can also use it, you, you can have it in an interactive way where you can use a device to open up certain parts of the, of the scroll. So to move forward, so this uh, very, very interesting experience. And then this is also a work of Jeffrey, which I really like, and it's about the Mo uh, Mogao, um, Mogao Grotus in Dunhuang in China. It is a magnificent environment, hundreds and hundreds of Buddhist caves that were um, painted throughout the centuries. And now they try to preserve them. They can, unfortunately, they cannot manage to to preserve all of them, because uh, it is just the the deterioration of the environment and and the humidity is just destroying the the painting. So what they are doing, this is work that they created, um, using those those um, those those caves. What they did is while we're waiting um what they did is they took a group of technologists and artists into one of the caves and they did a high detailed scan of the entire uh, cave where they were and then they used it to recreate a virtual um a virtual experience out of it this one is using augmented reality and uh I'm going to show you this in uh, let's see. Oh, so this is the mobile version. Okay. We will watch this first and then we will watch this one. Okay. We will watch this one. So this work is an example because it shows the issue of um, and traveling exhibition, something that is always problematic, especially if you're dealing with artifacts and especially if you're dealing with old stuff and old artifacts that are fragile. So what we have here uh, is the mobile version of the experience. The, the one that is more difficult to to move around is based in the AVI system that we saw uh, before. Uh, here you have tablets that are you see the white dots on them, white points. Those are used for navigation. Um, there is a sensor that is picking the position up, and then you look through the through the tablet as if you were looking at the walls of the cave. This type of experience also really uh, mitigates a serious problem regarding experience, and that is the singular the singularity of the experience, meaning that only one person at a time can experience this. Uh, here you, you can have more people uh, looking over the door and just observing the, the, the space. Um, originally, the, the original version, the first one, like, we'll see how it looks. But it's in the list that we, that we saw uh, before. And I hope it will not yell. Yeah. And it used um, Sarah Kenderdine, by the way. One of the leading museologists, incredible woman. Um, she's doing some amazing work. Some of the projects that they're doing together with the Jeffrey are really amazing. They they have been developing immersive immersive technologies, platforms for viewing platforms that sh uh, that have the idea of the museum of the future, um, revolving around these type of technologies. Uh, where you can have it built in different locations and you can have simultaneous exhibitions. Um, very, very interesting concepts. So this is 
as you can see, one of the caves, they have more caves that you can just choose from and look around. What I like really about this experience is that uh, you can use your device that you have as a torch light. So you're in this complete darkness and you can just uh, navigate, you can navigate as if you are exploring the cave for real. Um, of course, this is 3D. You saw her, she had 3D glasses. So it is really, it's really immersive content. You cannot translate that to a 2D screen, obviously, um, but we can, we can imagine how it is. You can expect things much closer, uh, you know, than, than you could usually uh, do. And you can add some extra information uh, on top of that and even interactions that are at some point. Yeah, they have placed animations um, that put everything into, into perspective and, and bring everything uh, into life. Let, let us find some examples. So this is just one small example. You can really, you can highlight using these uh, principles and approaches, elements of the um, entire, entire experience. So that is pure land and then we uh, go forward a simple um i will not even open the the video here because it's it's not uh too uh you know wow or anything but it's a very simple use of this technology of this technology that can be applied and have much more intense impact and uh, basically this is uh, a museum in Washington dedicated to the Holocaust. It was placed in, it recreated uh, this tower of uh, the, the Lithuanian, that is filled with images and photos from the Lithuanian community. Um, and you can use your phone it, it, first as, a, as, a, as an experience of how it is created. It's very, very interesting. Um, it really gives off a very intensive vibe uh, when you see it. And um, you can use your phone to get more information about the people um, and how they survived, if they survived, what were their life trajectories and so forth. Um, now we're getting to this work that I did for, for um, as part of this UNESCO residency uh, in collaboration with the Media Arts Center in Changsha. And uh, it was something that we did with the goal to get engaged with the cultural heritage um, of the city. Some of the practices, also like material, non-material uh, heritage, some practices um, that were ongoing there. And it is a very interesting discussion because it asks a lot of question about how, what remediation is, to what extent you have a freedom to explore the ideas behind the practice, not necessarily just showing artifacts and you know just have data for them, uh, but also have some artistic license to play with them a bit more and to highlight the the ideas behind these practices. Um, and it also opens up the question about um, accessibility to, to the works. Um, this is how it looks. So it is a VR installation where we have taken a, a Taoistic burial pot. There is this practice of Taoist monks that are placed into these pots. So um, when they are, they feel that they are about to expire, they go into inside these pots and start meditating, go into deep meditative state. Some argue that they can last like that for months. Uh, and they just put these pots in walls, in caves. Occasionally, uh, even today, we find these pots with people inside <laughs> them. <laughs> yes, so... Um, <laughs> So what we have, so what we did there was we found all of the, they're quite rare today. Uh, we found the person that was making them, we acquired one and we used it as an installation. 
um, the, audience the audience member would go inside and they would experience the point of view of, of, of clay being placed on pottery wheel. They embody the clay. Then the apprentice comes into the workshop and he, he starts making a small pot out of them. Now, the interesting, um, while this is uh, happening, he has this sort of mantra, uh, you know, inner monologue, uh, which is basically um, some some ideas from Lao Tzu that I that I took about um, the rigidity of of death and the uh, frailty of life. I mean, boiling down to to the idea that as long the thing is, if, as long as something is uh, weak and malleable, it means that it's living, so it can change. And as long as it's rigid, it doesn't mean that it's died, so it has reached its final form. So while he is creating this small pot, um, he's he's thinking about these things, and in the end, he creates, he makes this pot, the uh, he makes this uh, small pot, the the virtual pot that you see in front of you, and it comes to synchronous position with the physical pot that you are inside. So if you, if you have your hands, and usually everyone has their hands on the, uh, on the rim of the pot, now it has this, uh, the position of how your hands are placed, it's very similar to where your hands would be um, if you are in this small pot, inside this small pot. So there is this weird combination of the physical sensuality and the visual information you have. Um, it is an interesting discussion about presentation um, and to what extent do you have the freedom to do so. We were given, of course, a freedom to, to explore it more and to just to play with, to, just to in, enter into discussion and dialogue with the community that is, that is there. Also, it is, question, it is discussion about representation and where and how do you bring these ideas to a larger audience? Of course, the main backdrop of everything that was done there was that we were trying to put these practices uh, in front of a larger contemporary and younger audience. Uh, this entire um, exhibition took place in the Xie Zhilong Gallery, which is I believe the biggest privately owned modern art uh, gallery in, in China. Um, it was just amazing how, <laughs> how, how everything was, was, was going on and how many people uh, wanted to see this. Um, of course, it is China, much bigger, bigger market, um, but it's, it's very interesting to, to just to think about how do you present a virtual reality to so many people when you have one headset because the the artifact itself was very important. So this opened um, another uh, discussion. This is just the image that I really like. You can see me here checking out this tiny boy. His parents wanted to <laughs> for for him to figure to to experience uh, this this installation. And it is more you know in all of it, it's about how do you make things accessible. Uh, to a larger audience, and um, it can feel a bit perverted, maybe, to think about presenting, um, especially if we talk about artifacts and historical information in an Instagrammable or viral way, but um, it really does help a lot if you can give something, the people that engage with the work that you're creating, so they're willing to share it with others. So it's, it, it pays dividends uh, to, to just have a, to have a way to insert the people into the experience and then document that experience and then share it forward. Um, but again, this is virtual reality and it opens this entire discussion of which technologies do you apply and what do you apply them for? If you have one headset, you have one person at a time. If you have an experience that lasts 15 minutes, let's say, you have onboarding, offboarding of 
five minutes if you're very efficient and you have people that know what they're doing on the spot i usually make uh, always the mistake to create some works when, when we're talking about artistic works of course uh, where i i have to be there all the time so some of the artists will just install something and leave i have to be there but it opens up uh, an opportunity for me to really engage with uh, people that are coming to discuss the ideas, to discuss the technology, to meet them. And uh, I'm in contact with some of uh, some people that I've met coming to my installations uh, even today. So it's a, it's a very, it's a different way of interacting with the audience. But what you see in front of you is something that I, I took it as a, as an idea as a mission to have it, to have this uh, story, to have this artifact, this practice, uh, to the Taoist practice, but also the artifacts and the entire practice of creating this type of pottery um, accessible to larger audience. Now, this is an idea and ren render, uh, render of an idea that we had for um, the, the tech museum in, in Munich. Uh, who, like they wanted to bring the pottery, it was already agreed to have it um in from china for six months there um unfortunately the corona crisis happened so everything got you know <laughs> derailed but we were thinking about how to have it have how to have this experience in a more hybrid format so i came up with this idea to create a fake archaeological dig site in the museum where we would have the pot placed as a centerpiece as if it was uncovered so the audience members can just roam freely around this place one of them can be into the pot at a time of course but others can interact with the environment so you would have people from the museum dressed as uh, archaeologists uh, just uh, being around and also uh, I wanted to create augmented reality part of the experience where we would use papers like newspapers where we would create AR codes that can be used to engage with uh, the story like we, I wanted to create like these uh, early 20th century findings um, for some, for example, someone discovers a tomb somewhere in Egypt, and it's like a newspaper finding. I wanted to create a fake finding for this archaeological dig site, but to use it in order to um, open up more and more information about what was going on and how it was used. Uh, so to create a fiction out of some, uh, but presenting something very, very real in sense of practices. Um, so it, this is a good example to see how do you weigh the benefits, the pros and cons of different technologies. Um, another one, and we're finalizing, yeah, we're getting to the end with this. This is something that we see, um, that we see quite often now, and this is more of a map-based city walk uh, type of experiences. This is similar to what uh, what was done on the, the project that Angela mentioned, uh, having a map of archaeological sites where you can just move around and you can get to specific points that of interest. What you see here uh, is uh, developed also by uh, Zetkan. Um, and it is picking individuals famous individuals from the history of Karlsruhe um, that are yeah, that, were, that were living in the that were living in the city and you can use the app on your phone to navigate the to navigate the city to get to the the, the points where where you would want to be and engage in different ways with specific physical objects. Sometimes this would be, as you can see on the right, um, the, the bust of Heinrich Hertz, where you can use uh, your device to scan the AR, AR code. And what you have here is you have the Hertz wave, like the visualization of Hertz waves coming out of the, the, the statue of the bust. Um, 
but the most interesting example from uh, the all of these uh, elements from uh, the Maptory, from the Kalsra Maptory, is one specific um, point, and that is the story about Kla Clara Imerva, who, who was uh, the wife of Fritz Haber. Both of them successful chemists. Fritz Haber, uh, maybe you know about him. He was the person who invented fertilizer. And coincidentally, chemical warfare that was used in World War One. So, a lot of people died directly because of his work, and many, many more were saved later because of fertilizers uh, and access to food. So, what you have, um, what you have here as a story is that uh, she always lived in his shadow, right? Um, and she had a very anti-war stance and she was very concerned with the ethical consequences of, uh, of what she was doing. So, uh, I don't know if you're doing Someone is doing something. <laughs> there is some, some kitchen work involved. <laughs> um, So what, uh, what happened is that um, eventually she committed suicide. Um, and there's a lot of speculation about why that happened. People more informed with the life of the family. Um, and it's the consensus that it was done because she just couldn't handle the pressure of, um, of her husband's work, the ethical consequences of her husband's work. And they, they honored her into this uh, experience where you have to get to a point and you can see this brick wall on the upper image. Um, and this is what you see when you look through your viewing device. The window is open and you can see an actor playing Clara Imervar and she tells, she recites uh, letters that she has, basically stating her, uh, her points of view, her, her life, her life outlook. While she's doing that, she is, okay, <laughs> I'll just show the, the video briefly. Lieber Fritz. Ich weiß nicht, wo anfangen. Ich bin müde. So while she is uh, ich müde wie noch nie in Leben. While she is uh, giving her perspective on things, she is uh, um, breaking herself into into the the room, blocking out the window. And then when you finish with the experience and you take your phone off. Uh, phone down, you see the, the bricked wall in front of you. So it's a very interesting artistic um, rendering of, um, of her character uh, and, and her historical um, point, point of view in all of this. So takeaways, um, when we talk about experiences, immersive experiences, think about how we can dis disperse the story how we can disperse uh, navigation through it. Think about what are the principles of play or of gamification, of interfaces. So all of these are very, very large discussions and come into design uh, when, when it's important. Mm, we will, I will talk in the end briefly about the experienced designer as a, as a role that is now becoming very evident and needed. Um, also, point three, this is something very important for the, especially for, for, archaeolo for, archaeolo for archaeology and for historical um, experiences. You have to stick to the information, right? You have to stick to the, to the reality of it. But keep in mind that 
stating facts is not creating experiences. Um, you create experiences around facts, not, not the other way around. Um, cur the, cur the curatorship is something that starts even before the experience begins. It is deeply integrated into the design of the entire uh, immersive experience. It begins, ooh, you have to decide when it begins, basically. Does it begin when they decide to buy tickets? That, does it begin when they see commercial? Does it begin when they are arrive on the location? Does it begin when they enter into the space? Does it begin when they put a headset on? The best experiences, if you're talking about best practices, the experience starts at least when they enter the space, not necessarily when they put the headset on. So there is a process of onboarding, which is very important to create this sense of uh, other reality in which they're going to step into. And the offboarding process, very important to have uh, space for them to just wind down and to uh, share their experience. Usually a lot of, depending on how intense the experience is, but people want to discuss People want to share their experience. Uh, very important element, and this is the maintenance and the problem of obsolescence of technology. We are sometimes, you know, dazzled by these technologies. We want to use them everywhere. We think that just by having it, we are going to be successful at creating an experience. This is not the case. I've encountered many uh, situations where you would have a great experience, but you don't, uh, like usually production wise, people don't take into account the need for operating these technologies, meaning that you have to have trained people that understand what the technology is, not just put a button, take the cable out, do this, do that, but understand why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, in order to maintain the experience and present it as it is uh, in, uh, as it should. Another problem is the maintenance of technology and the, the technology getting outdated fairly fast. So you need to take into account that you will uh, structure your budgeting, for example, in a way that it you figure out how long do you want this to last? If it's five years, you have to budget maintenance for five years and to be very, to be very straightforward and clear about this. Um, another important moment is that the, 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 the experiences are multi-layered in the sense that now you can, now you have artifacts as focal points of the experiences, but you can create pretty much whatever you like with an asterisk that whatever you like is a lot of money and know-how. <laughs> uh, but you can, you can think about so many different ideas about creating not just representation of works, but uh, experiences that can bridge different types of borders and obstacles. That opens up the question of what a cultural heritage location is that opens up the question of what a museum is. And we are seeing the rapid development of museums into something completely different than what it is in a traditional sense. Unfortunately, uh, Europe is still very conservative regarding how it engages with its cultural heritage. Um, unlike Asia, that is, which is very open to just playing with it. Just, you know, take it apart, reassemble it, of course, stay respectful to, to the, the intent behind it. Um, but it's a, it's a very clear difference that I've uh, experienced uh, working in, in both environments. Um, and why this is important? It is because if we are allow ourselves to play with mediation and remediation, we have the opportunity to reach audiences that that we have first, they were never part of, of what we, we wanted to, to do and to create a lasting interaction and discussion because in the end it is about um, creating cultural spaces that are lived culture, that are places not where you have glorified um, 
tombs of things, you know, like a glorified depot where just people walk around, they see a placket, they read something and they leave. But it's more about engaging with the, uh, with the, uh, with the artifacts in a more meaningful way, but also engaging with people. Um, and this is where a lot of good practices can be employed from uh, research institutions, uh, contemporary, uh, contemporary museums, not necessarily contemporary art museums, but contemporary museums. Denmark has a very, very strong move forward uh, regarding this pub public cultural industry where museums take very interesting uh, open pu public open environment where different types of activities are organized inside and the curatorship becomes um, sometimes even something that happens outside of the exhibition. So these technologies can really can really open up a lot of a lot of these topics. Um, yes, so this is where I'm going to uh, end, and uh, I'm looking forward to hear to hear your experiences, to hear uh, your thoughts about it. Uh, there are some great works done. Um, if you want to reach out for anything for a question, feel free to. Um, uh, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to to see how how you think these technologies can be used and where the potentials uh, issues uh, issues with, with it. So let me start sharing this now, and uh, we can we can go into the next section. Thank you very much, Stefan. It was uh, very very interesting and useful presentation I hope for all the entire audience. I think that we saw some great examples uh, of the new technologies uh, involved in projects uh, with cultural heritage. And then um, now I would ask um, and invite everyone to share your questions either in the chat or just to raise your hands. So we do have our first question in the chat and this is from um, Karen Schneier, uh, I'm going to read it. If everyone uses augmented reality, how do you know what is real? For example, in dating apps, uh, does anyone post a picture of their real unembellished appearance? If all users are in their own personally created space, how does one know what is real? Does reality matter? <laughs> That is a, a very, <laughs> a very complicated discussion. Um, well, we still haven't figured out exactly what reality is, right? Uh, so then just figuring out what virtual reality or augmented reality is and what is the ontological reality of those artifacts there, it's still up for debate, right? And it, I, I believe it's also part of how you, what is your philosophical outlook of how uh, things exist. But I, I love this question. And I really don't want to start <laughs> playing with it because <laughs> it's going to take hours. Um, but let's focus on the first part. Now, if, if everyone, there, there is this tension between um, the, the the use of the words like we have we have we're not using virtual reality in the best way possible because it leaves so many things not clear um, the easiest distinction that i've i've seen so far is that virtual is not uh, opposite of real Fiction is opposite of real. Virtual is just um, another mode of e existence of information. So w w your question here, it is more connected to, I would say, the, the identity of what you are seeing there. And I would say that in order to Minimum, minimize the potential friction 
we need to act first in good faith, of course, and then to be very transparent of what we are doing. Not necessarily inside the experiences, um, but to be very evident how they end and to have this time of reflection afterwards where we open up the discussion. Because as, as your questions here uh, suggest, these technologies are going to create a lot of problems, um, especially regarding our understanding of what reality is. And that transition won't go that smoothly, I think. Um, this is why we need to have these uh, reflection post experiences. And sometimes just to, to accept that these things that we are creating exist in a very real way because you can not let's not open that discussion but now with neurocognitive research we have seen that uh, the brain pretty much does not make difference between uh, virtual reality experience and uh, physical reality experience it is pretty much the same for it so take any you know anything out of it <laughs> it is a serious ethical question and it has to be done with care this is why um, I, I didn't I didn't speak a lot about the, the experience designer and the role of the experience designer but that's what basically is is to figure out um, how to create experience if we take more traditional words how to direct like how they how to be the director of an experience in a collaborative experience where you would leverage these technologies for uh, in an ethical way and you would create the effects that you want the the people to to experience thanks i mean i would like, love to continue this <laughs> and unpacking this question but uh we'll go into ontology and that is a discussion that is not settled <laughs> in the history of philosophy anyhow Uh, you're muted, Angela. Sorry, uh, Diana, please go ahead with the next question. Yeah. Uh, yes, people will get addicted to virtual reality. That will happen. People get addicted to social you're media. You're muted. Okay. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Um, nice to see you. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, hello from England. Um, I just Hi. had a question about uh, accessibility. Um, I've worked with being on basically the teams in museums, working with visitors. And the number one accessibility complaint that we have is for um, our neurodiverse community. Um, so like people with autism, um, they find a lot of, especially the partial and full immersion, um, let's like the sensory combinations and the amount of sensory of different things, it's not very friendly for them. Um, I was just wondering if you've, looked into that, any of that accessibility issues, or if anyone has, um, that would be really interesting. Thanks for the, for the question. This is very, this is very important. Um, and it is not just about, uh, you know, non-neurotypical people, it is about all of us. Like if we create a bit of, a bit of dissonance of how we uh, experience reality, it can be it can be emotionally and psychologically damaging for uh, for anyone, and even more so uh, when people have a condition that highlights certain sensory inputs. So here you have to tread very lightly, be very careful about how you introduce and what, what in, you introduce. Sometimes it's better not to introduce. You know, like we want to create experiences and use technology just to. Uh, elevate the value uh, of, of visitors, but sometimes you take away from the experience, uh, you make it even less accessible. There are works that are very nice. Um, I, I believe someone was talking about it in a letter before, um, about this lovely work called Touching Masterpieces. 
and I was very, I, I was very, very happy to see it being uh, discussed because a, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine from from Prague, was working on its development, and it's about uh, blind people using haptic feedback gloves to touch uh, 3D reconstructions of um, virtual reconstructions of famous sculptures. So what they did was they took uh, they took um, 3D 3D scans of Michelangelo, let's say, and they they used the 3D object to create uh, points. They they placed points on the uh, 3D object, and when you get your hands into the space of the 3D object, you would get vibration in the um, in the in the in the gloves. So for um, for visually impaired people, this is a way to interact with artifacts uh, in a very intimate way. And I would argue that that is even more intimate way of interacting, especially for sculpture, uh, than we have, or non visually impaired people. And um, um, I... so why? Yeah, sorry, I, I, I was at a conference where there's a presentation where there's a company that's now 3D printing paintings down to like millimeters. You can actually touch a Van Gogh and that was also talked about with a physical object in the physical world that you can touch without, you know, touching an actual Van Gogh. And that was quite interesting. Of course, because I mean, we are touching, that is, like touches our first sense basically, because we do not develop you know, our visual sense uh, immediately after we are born. It's more about touch. So it's a very intimate way of understanding the the world around us. So sometimes when people have uh, some sense, senses heightened, we have to be aware of what we are creating, and of course have you know have disclaimers, uh, be very clear about it and um, we are learning how to do this you know it's still very early i've seen some interesting works being done in treatments for autism in vr where um, they try to train the the user to to offset basically the sensorial inputs you know in a safe and gradual environment so they get more uh, how to call it resilient I would say um, to, to train the sense to, to, to be able to take more and more and more so we, we will be doing these type of things in VR uh, more and more but at this stage we have to be careful uh, not to make it unpleasant for, for any anyone involved and this is the one of the, the jobs of uh, the experience designer because the experience designer is not just about you know ah, we need to make someone walk through the cathedral and do xyz but it's also about uh, figuring out how to give them the right information at the right time how to teach them about interactivity with space how not to overwhelm the users but to give them different senses uh, being dominant in different times so this is this is where the true artistry is happening and um, usually my entry point into experience design was through philosophy and then film directing and being always being deeply involved with computer games and just figuring out interactivity and then get, getting more into neurocognitive sciences, um, interactive design, interface design. So all of these things add layers to, to, to these experiences where you, at, at least you try not to have someone puke <laughs> in VR. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Okay, we have Dushan. Glad to see you. Very nice to see you, Stefan, and uh, of course, other colleagues from Balkan Heritage Foundation. And I hope that you had a really nice time in Mona and Viminatio developing the, the project about immersing heritage. And I'll be happy to hear if you have some um, 
maybe new perspectives, uh, working with the other two groups of the field, Heritage Field School. And uh, did you develop the game and the application we've been <laughs> working and speaking about? <laughs> Yeah, you, if you want, you can respond to the question, but actually I would really love to thank you for this very interesting uh, presentation, which was somehow uh, for me at, uh, in some last period, I'm much more interested in those kind of uh, technologies and possibilities than I was previously. And uh, of course, uh, thanks to you somehow, but uh, I was a little bit wondering about uh, Balkan, so our uh, cultural and geographical context, you said that in uh, Europe, these technologies actually are not as much developed as, for example, in Asia. But uh, do we have some good examples or maybe some bad examples of using VR and AR and mixed realities in the heritage context of uh, Balkan, mm -hmm. for example? That is that is a great uh, uh, that is a great question. Um, honestly, in the Balkans, I've not seen like bad bad examples, uh, and throughout Europe, I have not seen like bad bad examples. And by bad, I mean uh, something like you're walking away from the experience feeling bad. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that would be a yeah. bad bad uh, experience. Um, usually we have, and this is why I, I was giving uh, examples for gradual adoption of what we did, for example, 10 years ago and where we are now. And, you know, where, like when we talk about these type of experiences, this is more or less the baseline that we have settled on. Like it is probably a 360 video that you can, can uh, look or you can have some interaction. Uh, one of it is just like having interaction with the virtual object. Another one is more into this location-based um, city walk replication um, that was used also on the on the project. This is very this is established approach, I would say. Um, the technology, I, I think, it's more about the difference between Europe and Asia. Here is more highlighted in the conceptual approach towards the technology. Um, there is always some element of shame attached to using virtual reality in Europe that I see in public places. Um, there is always like, do I look goofy? Don't take silly pictures of me. You know, don't tag me if I don't look okay. Uh, you know. Um, we can speculate why that is, but that's another thing. In 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 Asia, there it is much more open in that sense that mm -hmm. everyone is having fun with it. Like they they want to to look as silly as possible and just be just explore it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, we can speculate why that is and how these differences came to be, but this is important to have in mind when we talk about curatorship uh, because you have to take into account the sensibility of the audience because unlike you know a sculpture is always is, is sculpture everywhere it doesn't matter if you put it in rome or you put it in uh changsha you know it's this it's a sculpture you know people come they observe it they walk around it you know there is a it's it's a curate it's put into a curatorial context one way or another um, this type of con of um, of content has a it is much more subjective, I would say, and that means that it interacts with the cultural uh, with the cultural context where it's presented in a more immediate way because you know it it goes back to the question about what is reality uh, because our reality differs culturally which is nice because that's where diversity and diverse ideas come from right um but you have to be aware that some things that you feel are self-evident are not when you relocate in, in in different cultures and this is 
this cultural awareness is very important. Um, so it, it's just fun to explore it, if you ask me, you know, just like creating this, the creating experiences, um, having these, uh, these questions in mind. Because then you can create effects, like specific effects, you know, it makes you more precise in, in what you instill in the audience. Thanks. I think also that we in Europe have those feeling of that we have to be very serious, very, you know, respecting everything and so on. And then some other cultures are more open and more flexible, more, more maybe enjoying your life also with that. Uh, uh, like in that case, you said with uh, uh, we are realities. I, I have one example, and which I just want to mention, share with you that uh, one local uh, museum in Kljevlja, I'm speaking about Montenegro, the country where I'm actually coming from, we, which hasn't, uh, I would say, uh, many virtual reality and uh, mixed reality and augmented reality experiences, but that one local museum in Kljevlja and in the north of Montenegro made very interesting part of their permanent archaeological exhibition. They had amazing Roman sites, they made, uh, I think, the first in Montenegro, actually hologram of uh, one uh, very interesting Roman find. It's Diatreta, the glass made of with very specific way of uh, uh, like filigranic work. I'll now present you on my cell phone if you can see that very thinny, very beautiful, uh, which is actually kept in some very specific way. So they made 3D hologram, which is, you know, making a circle and every visitor can observe it. So maybe just that that example from Montenegro, which I know is a very good, but maybe uh, we will have in the future something more. <laughs> so thank you. Well, the good thing, I would say the good thing about the Balkans is that uh, a lot of our cultural uh, institutions and sites can really benefit from um, rapid development or reconstruction. <laughs> so that means that um, at least infrastructure wise, there is not weight placed by what was done before um, in, in many cases, I would say. So you can really, you can start, you can move in a, in a more, I would say brave way, you know, like you can just be be free about it a bit, a bit more, um, just because you don't have the possibility to destroy something that was already there that much. Of course, that differs from place to place, you know, but the potential is there. You know, it's <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you for that uh, response, Stefan. And then we have another question uh, in the chat. Uh, by Carol Schneier again, what happens when people prefer their virtual reality over real reality? Can people become addicted to their virtual augmented reality? Um, I, I'm, you know, I really like this question because it's, um, it shows how much in what the language we are uh, having hard time to accept the, the reality of the virtual reality because again, the brain really does not make difference. So now we are into, into the room of neurocognitive sciences and it is more about what is called fidelity of sensorial inputs. When we talk about external, uh, external stimuli being used to create internal states, right? Um, people will be addicted. People are addicted to social media now. People, and you know, we don't really care about that. Uh, people are addicted to video games. Um, you can get addicted to anything, and virtual reality will be extended reality will be a thing of the future. The biggest problem here would be because it's of created nature. And it's used to recontextualize information from the real world. Then it can serve as a sort of a veil between ourselves and the other, the object, and increasingly more as a veil between 
us and ourselves where we have even now if you think about it we we you know we have smart watches that measure everything we do and we're not even listening to our own bodies we are looking at the data of that the device is collecting uh, we are not looking where we are moving we are looking at a top-down view of an environment and we are following the line on google maps and using gps this is highly non-traditional uh, way of navigating because when you think about how we used to navigate until we had phones we were navigating mostly of course you know treated name all that also just looking at buildings looking at objects it's like Aha, uh -huh, the tall building and behind the tall building, there's that. And this is how we have navigated since the beginning of, of time, basically. The idea of that, aha, uh -huh, go that way for some time and then you get to the crooked tree. And when you get to the crooked tree, turn right, don't go left. And if you go right, then you go la la la. So we, we were navigating ourselves, creating the reality of what is around us through these physical phenomena that, that we had. And now we have uh, this, what is called basically post phenomenal local presentation of our reality. So we are looking at some aggregation of information presented in one way or another, right? So this is where I, the biggest threat I would say is, it's not about addiction because, you know, we are addicted to things all the time, but it's understanding the nature of the addiction, understanding what the power of this in-between technology is, um, and to understand how much of this interaction that we are having with the other object is curated by the veil of uh, virtual reality or extended, extended reality. Uh, there is a lovely film that I, I usually show it on workshops um, and sometimes when we talk about um, about augmented reality, it's called the hyper reality. It's by a Japanese uh, uh, film director. It's a short film, and it's about um, a woman in high adoption AR environment in in the world. She has a, a malfun malfunctioning issue with. With the, with the technology and it opens up so many of these uh, questions in such a small format very compact and I highly recommend it hyper reality short short film so yes it's uh, you know it gives it, it gives philosopher and policy makers something to think about <laughs> oh definitely and if I may ask now um, do you have a dream project of yours with augmented reality if yes, can you please share something like <laughs> if it's not too personal, sorry. No, it's not. It's, thanks for, for the question. I mean, there are projects that uh, there's there's there are many ideas, of course, some projects into some phases of development, um, some on hold, some successful, you know, it's that that's how life is. Um, I mean, I like dealing with education and virtual reality quite a lot. I did some consultancy on development of educational uh, programs for uh, for virtual reality, and it's something that I find very uh, very exciting. Um, but if we're talking about more artistic things, there are some very abstract things that I want to play with. But there is one project that uh, I will mention. Um, so I didn't talk about here about a lab that is based in Mosul. Um, we did some 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 workshops with them. Uh, very very driven, incredible young group of people. Uh, group of young people, architects, programmers, game designers. And they are using uh, photogrammetry, virtual reality technology to preserve Nineveh, the ancient capital that is next to Mosul, who got and, and a lot of things got damaged there. Um, 
through the through the war and especially uh, when ISIS was there and all the, all those uh, things that were happening. So they are trying to reconstruct them and tell stories, like how to tell, do not just reconstruct, but how to tell a story through it. So with with another friend of mine, um, an American uh, film director who's doing a, also a lot of VR, they're developing with the Goethe Institute a very interesting uh, project called the Infinite Library, which is about a bit more artistic. Like the, the idea of the infinite library is that you are in this hub space and from there you can navigate into other rooms where you would have um, more artistic exploration of some of some uh, experiences right so one was for example a library of practices um, of indian uh, silks and fabrics like how how they were made how they were used uh, another one was about mycelium. Another one was about, you know, like you had all different uh, libraries. And one of the ideas what we wanted to do, and this was a project that we were uh, trying to get off the ground. Um, the lab, the guys from the lab had connections with, um, with the British Museum. And um, the Gilgamesh tablets were found in Nineveh, and most of them are in the British Museum. So what I, we were trying to do was to get 3D scans of the actual artifacts, um, of the actual tablets, of the actual Gilgamesh tablets, and to use some of them with, that are uh, from key points in the story and to create this experience where you, in virtual reality, you have a, some gamified way of exploring the tablets, but you have to place them on certain altars, you have to put them together. And my idea was to create at least key parts of the uh, Gilgamesh story uh, by actually having and interacting with the, again, is, is it the right word, with the real um, representation of the tablets. So to have the 3D scan of the real tablets and to have them inside the experience. Um, it's, you know, it's, this thing is on hold, but we were going back and forth with this idea for a while. And uh, for me, this is also something very interesting to just to take artifacts and to, to make them available in, in different ways to, to larger audiences, but also to, different ways of engaging with them just to, to think about like what are artifacts once we have the ability to break them apart completely and to turn them into something completely else um what it what exactly it opens like what is the hyper and intercontextuality of things uh, in this in this space which is which is a topic i i believe deeply in deeply present into the discussion of archaeology and history in general. Well, yes, thank you for uh, that, uh, for your thoughts. Actually, I also do believe that um, augmented reality can help very much into making the accessibility of um, the cultural heritage um, more and more open for the audience. Because we still have uh, this problem when trying to present, for example, archaeological finds or sites, um, that there is a lot behind the scene happening, which cannot be actually shown uh, in the best way to the ordinary people, just in the showcases of the museum or even on the site. So with augmented reality, definitely we can reach much more. And I hope that this um, direction will be uh, more and more active in the future um, for more and more museums in order to attract more and more people and to um, present them what do we have in the most accessible way. Because often, especially in, let's say, um, the professionals are fighting with that problem, um, trying not to, how to say, uh, to skip the scientific part of the project and in the same time to uh, to show it in the best approachable way to uh, to the audience. Uh, but in the meanwhile, we do have also new questions in the chat. 
So we do have another one by Carol Schneier, and this is um, in the US, we had a recent experience with a large number of citizens sharing an alternate reality about the outcome of uh, the 2020 presidential election. As AR becomes more widespread, what safeguards um, can ensure it's uh, misused to create chaos, uh, decent <laughs> dissension and social unrest? Currently none. Uh, and uh, it will be like this for a long time because this is a much larger discussion about centralization or distribution of power because uh, at this point, we're still trying to figure out how this is going to exist because um, Facebook is trying to do something they have they're struggling a lot with with uh, their product um, there is the issue of open XR where you can distribute things it is a serious problem I mean it is a serious problem not just on you know te technology I don't think technology is the problem in any case, like if you take any technology, even if you take technology as a gun, for example, I, I don't I don't think there is good and bad technology. It is the intent that you use it to behind it. Uh, it would be great if we can live in uh, in a world where you know everything is just uh, you know <laughs> nice, but um, technology is. I always want to say that technology is just an amplifier. Um, is amplifying the results of the intentions with which we approach a certain situation. So the more powerful the technology, the more self-aware we have to be about what we want, what reality is, to be open about what is going on in general, because we will more and more see new technologies that have bigger power that are accessible to larger stakeholders and uh, we will see some very interesting changes very in the next 10 15 years regarding these technologies i, I would say not just not just ar we have we have of course the issue of, of uh, biohacking and uh, artificial intelligence, like a lot of other <laughs> things being uh, being around. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, let's see. Really, and so the next question is probably mm, very much covered by the answer you just gave. Mm -hmm. What are the major ethical issues with using VR? Uh, given the I would say the biggest, the biggest one is. Um, creating emotional states that are um, aggressive unless people do that willingly, of course. And uh, we will see, we are already seeing, and there are some very questionable um, uses of VR for psychological reprogramming. Um, and this is what we are going to see increasingly because we uh, we used we used some research that was done by i don't remember the the name of the it was a consult it's a very it's a big consultancy firm using for tech industry it is the like the the short memory retention and long memory retention and muscle memory when you train in VR or experience something in VR is many, many times uh, more successful than if you just have it in a physical space, if you look at video or if you just, of course, if you have, if you're in physical space, you're trying things out, but you cannot try things in uh, sometimes, especially in high, in, in, in um, fields or industries where, you know, a small mistake can cost hundreds of thousands or millions right so 
this is going to be a very, very problematic of applications of, of these technologies because they're very powerful in um, reprogramming psychological states. I, I even say that once we hit mainstream, like one billion devices, we will get to a point of um, psychological restructuring on an industrial scale. And, um, you know, it can, it can be very dangerous, <laughs> you know, it can be very dangerous. I would say vigilance, clarity, um, inform yourself about the technologies, um, try to act in good faith with, with these technologies. You know, that would be, that would be the biggest one, because I think uh, a lot of people are jumping on this. I mean, I'm talking with some with people that are trying to figure out how to use this as a product in this regard. So, you know, it is definitely something that we, we are seeing currently and we will see more as a finalized product uh, adopted by, widely. When this gets into education, for example, on a wider scale, maybe not in five, five, 10 years, maybe even 15, 20 years, who knows how things are going to develop, but it's a power of technology that we need to be aware of. Definitely, that's in control somehow. It has to be controlled by <laughs> the institutions responsible, hopefully. Well, um, are there any more questions for Stefan tonight? Um, if not, I'd like you to thank you once again for um, the great effort uh, for presenting this uh, presentation in front of our audience. I think that it was highly appreciated. Um, and I do hope that we have other chances in the future to follow your path, your new projects, and to invite you again. Um, so um, I would like to use the case uh, now to announce our next presentation, which is going to um, happen on, the, on November the 5th at the same time. Uh, it is going to be presented by Ivan Vasilev, our colleague, our friend, and the CEO of the Balkan Heritage Foundation. He is going to talk about um, the recent results of the Fresco Hunt Expedition, which is happening uh, since 2008 in the border region uh, of Serbia and Macedonia. So we're going to post uh, that information on our homepage, and you're welcome to um, to register for that and yeah so thank you everyone and have a great evening Stefan if you if you want to stay for a bit as you can see we're receiving <laughs> thank you thank you very much yeah yes. the kind words um I, I I'm very happy you you enjoyed it this is a very large topic of course and you can go into one small element for hours, hours, and there are books and research written, decades of research done on just a small segment. Um, you are in a very interesting line of work because you are creating realities to through the curatorial process. So you are dealing with this. You are dealing with virtual reality, uh, um, even without maybe the technology. So you know, if, if we, of course, look at it in a, in a broader way. So it is a quite important, I would say, field of work because uh, you, you are shaping the narrative of how things are. So keep that in mind. And uh, I hope uh, these uh, examples we, we uh, looked and analyzed and some of the principles that we discussed will will bring you some inspiration for for your further work and i'm looking forward to to speak with you with some other exciting things in the future me too i hope that it will be soon um, so have a great evening again uh, everyone and uh, see you very soon <laughs> <laughs>